you hear this right now? It's on? Okay. <clears throat> My wife and I were discussing this past week, even as we were driving along in the vehicle, we we're thinking, you know, times have really changed as far as church goes. You know, we were just talking about how we grew up in, we grew up in Baptist churches. Um, I, I in Lakeside, in Duluth, Minnesota, and Nancy out in Fossil, Minnesota. She, they were both part of the Baptist General Conference. But it seems like most of the churches in our town, we didn't have a lot of large churches, really. I mean, there might have been churches up to four or 500, maybe like that. But usually there were churches. There were a number of them, whether they're Baptist or, or, or some other denomination. I know there was an Assemblies of God there. But they were all about maybe 200 and under, you know, 125 to 175, many churches like that. And we each had, uh, all those churches seemed to have youth groups. They all seemed to have vacation Bible schools. Most of them always had a Sunday evening service. And even when we were playing ball in high school, games were not held on Wednesday evening because that was an evening most of the, they knew that there were activities going on in the churches and the community. And so, and then of course there was, on Sunday you had Sunday school before church, right? And that, all these churches observed that way. And we were just talking about now how things have changed nowadays, you know? Uh, we don't, most churches don't have a Sunday school program anymore, starting out on Sunday morning. And they have like a kid's time, of church time, and sometimes, especially in the larger churches, they have very elaborate church time programs for kids. And then, of course, uh, there's, it seems like, and you follow in this community, you know, just talking a little while ago, we were talking about how our church has three churches that are meeting in our building. You know what? That's not uncommon. <laughs> there are other churches the same way. Churches, uh, the, now, many of the churches are dwindling down in size, whereas, you know, there are the huge churches but we're finding out the huge churches, though they draw a lot of people and they have, you know, professionalism to the nth degree as far as your stage. It's like a, a concert, uh, that type of thing. But they find out even those large churches that there is not a lot of spiritual knowledge and understanding and growth that takes place among the people. That's what they're learning. And so it's a different time in which we're living today. And we want to look at the book of Thessalonians because we want to find out what is the example of a model church. If you have opportunity, I would recommend that you go to the class at 9 o'clock, our adult Bible fellowship. Right there, Rick was talking, we were reading about the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation. And what an amazing thing it is to, to read what those churches were like in that area of Asia Minor. But we want to look at, the, continue our study of the book of Thessalonians. If you would turn over to the first chapter, and we're going to look at the characteristics of a model church. Last time we looked in this book, we were looking at the characteristics of the model church as far as the leaders were concerned. Now today we found out they were praying leaders, in particular proclaiming, they proclaimed the word of God. Now this morning though, we're going to look at the characteristics of the people in a model church. I want to read the whole first chapter, even though we're going to focus on verses 3 through 7 this morning. Let's begin reading. I'm out of the New King James Version Bible, uh, starting in verse 1 in chapter 1 of Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. 
For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Well, when the apostle here, he said that they were praying, they were continually remembering these Thessalonians. Remember, he was with them, as far as we know, only three Sabbath days. This is the most miraculous thing. And yet they taught these people so much. But they were in the synagogues three Sabbath days. Now, they might have been longer outside that it's not recorded. But in the book of Acts, three Sabbath days, that was it. And they covered so many topics. But in those Sabbath days, there were, remember the three types of people? There were some of the Jews in the synagogue came to Christ and believed that Jesus was their Messiah. And there was a lot of Jews that did not believe. You remember that as well? But then there were the Greek proselytes who found the words of the apostle Paul just fulfilling everything that they were looking for in life. And then there were these prominent women also who came to Christ. And so, uh, but three Sabbath days, and then they separated from the synagogue. But, so, uh, uh, the first thing I want to say about these people, and the first characteristic then that we see here, even found in these words, remembering your work of faith, your labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and Father. I want to say that these people, the first characteristic was saved people. They were saved people. Now that's kind of a, you know, a broad term. Everybody uses it. You know, we get so used to these Christianese terms so many times. I remember being up in northern Minnesota. One of the young men in our church, uh, Lakeside Baptist, he was... Uh, uh, he was going to, I think, maybe Woodland Junior High or uh, high school at the time. And he had written in some graffiti somewhere. I don't know where it was, but Jesus saves. And when, uh, up in northern Minnesota, it's hockey country. And some other kid wrote underneath, yes, but Esposito gets the rebound and scores. You know, yeah, see, for him, that's what saved meant to him. It means it was a slap shot was saved from going in the goal, you know. So what does it mean that they were a saved people, okay? Um, the first thing I want you to understand is that they were a changed people. Now, you, in the United States today, if you were to ask people, what does it mean to be a saved? What does it mean to be saved? That means you're saved from hell and you're on your way to heaven. What, is it, what do you have to do? You know, there are an awful lot of people that I've run into through the years that will say this, well, what you need to do is you need to pray to Jesus Christ and ask him, you know, to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior. And all of us would probably say, well, that's right. But the amazing thing, even we had a, the funeral for Wayne Hamilton this year, I pointed that out too. There are an awful lot of people today in the United States that they say they've asked Jesus Christ in their heart. They follow that prescription because so many churches preach that. And you know what? But their lives do not change. Do not change very much. They've invited Jesus Christ in their heart, but you know, church is not that important with them. There are a lot of things that are more important for most of the people in the United States, the majority of people. Um, they might be decent family people, not law uh, breakers as such, but... Uh, if you ask them, do you pray? And they say, sure, I pray. You know, whenever they go for a trip, they pray for safety. They pray that they might have their finances met. But basically, when you look at them and you compare them to the rest of the world who don't claim to be Christians, there doesn't seem to be much difference at all. So the first thing I want to say about these people is that they were a changed people. They were changed. How do you know that? The apostle said, we remember your work of faith. Now, they had a faith that caused a change in their life and caused them to do the good works of Jesus Christ. You know, somebody said this, and again, I pointed out in the funeral, made this statement, faith alone saves. Isn't that what it says, the Bible says? Anybody want to differ that? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you are saved through 
faith, and it's not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So faith alone saves, but here's the thing. Also, the faith that saves is not alone. Say, so what do you mean by that? The genuine faith, the living faith, the true faith always ushers in good works. The types of works that Jesus Christ requires. Now, anybody who is born again does not do those good works in order to be saved, but they do them because of gratitude for what the Lord God has done for them through Christ Jesus, right? They're just zealous to do good works. At the end of this chapter, these, this testimony, the witness of these Thessalonians went everywhere. And people in many other places, they were on, places, they were on the Ignatian Wade, uh, uh, you know, the Ignatian Wade, it went everywhere, but it, it went from the east to the west, and so Thessalonica was right on it. People were going through it. It's just like O'Hare Airport, you know, people coming and going through O'Hare Airport. But they heard how these believers, it says it in verse 9, or verse 8, for from you it sounded forth the word of God, so that those in Macedonia, Archaea, every place, uh, this is what they are saying, declare concerning what manner we had to you, how you turned to God from idols. They turned to God from idols. Now notice, and this is very important, they did not turn away from idols to God. They turned to God from idols. They didn't turn away from their idols to God. What I'm saying by that is this. You do not stop your sinning in order to receive Jesus Christ. Nobody can do that. It's impossible. But if you turn to Jesus Christ, you can stop your sinning. You can gain victory over the sins. They turned to God and no longer did they serve the idols anymore. These people said, you know, those Thessalonians, they used to just be so dedicated to go to the temple where the idols were. They'd bow down to these many Greek idols. They were faithful to these gods of Greece and to maybe the gods of Rome. But no longer were they there. Now they served the living and true God, and their works were different. They had a change of lifestyle. Now how about... Is that the way it is with these people who say, so many of them, they pray to prayer to receive Jesus Christ? How much time do you think they pick up their Bible and they read their Bible daily? You know, I, I was, you know, my kids gave us a thing that we are do every once a week. We, they they want to understand what my parents were like, what grow, my growing up years were like, what Nancy's growing up years were like. And one of the questions I had, what were your grandparents like? You know, so many times now that my mom and dad are passed away, I would want to ask them, well, what, where did Grandpa come from? What kind of family was he from again? You know, I want to know that stuff. Now it's too late. And so they want to get this information now. And I want to say, well, my Grandpa Cordes, I would come in, we'd be out at the cabin, and he would be in that great big uh, gray chair. And you know what he had right on the, you know, it was a chair with the sides on it, with straight sides, if you ever saw a chair like that. What he had on the side of his chair was his Bible. And when you'd come in, Grandpa Cordes would be out, and he maybe he was retired at that time. He'd be in the garden, working in the garden, or doing something around the lake. He'd come in, and he'd read his Bible. You'd see him do that all the time. How many people's lives are characterized by that today? And, you know, isn't it true that most people today, even if they call them evangelical Christians, they... They just uh, have goals that they want, love what they want to do, whether that's go to a Black Hawk game, go to a concert. Their lives are involved in all kinds of uh, activity that seem mostly related to them. But that wasn't true of these Thessalonian believers. They left their idols to serve the living and true God. You know, I, I remember I, I told you a while back I had this guy that hijacked my cousin's uh, name on Facebook and he he said that his mom was sick, and I said, your mom has already passed away, <laughs> Tim. You know, he hijacked Mike. But, you know, he then wanted to say, no, you don't understand. My mom is sick. He started communicating. I mean, he, he was different. Yeah, you caught me, but my mom is sick. That's why I'm, I'm doing this. He's trying to get some of my information or somebody else to get money, right? And I said, you already, you already have claimed to be a liar. I, there's nothing you can do to say that would cause me to think that you would say something honest. 
when somebody has proven to be a liar. But if I think, if I ask that man, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? I'm sure he would have said, yes, I do. I prayed and I received, asked the Lord to be my Lord and Savior. But his life, he was scamming people. That's the way it seems like it is with a lot of people in the United States. Well, these people had a genuine faith. Do you remember the book of James says this? Faith without works is dead. Now, that does not mean that you got to do works in order to get to heaven. That's not what that means. But the genuine faith, the faith that is alive, it's not dead, but is alive, issues forth in good works. Lives like Jesus Christ. And you know, you don't have to tell these people to do this or do that. They just, it's in their heart. They've got that genuine faith. Well, notice the second thing they notice about their changed life. It says, their labor of love. Now, um, I was listening to a preacher on these passages, and he was kind of brushed up my Greek a little bit. He said, these are objective genitives. And I said, objective genitives? That just does not sound right. And I looked it up and said, no, what they are is subjective genitives. Now I said, well, what are you talking about? What, what's, what's the significance of that? Well, for example, if I told you uh, somebody, there, was, uh, there was a fear of dogs, a fear of dogs, fear of dogs. Now what I meant by that is that dogs have a lot of fear. Is that what I'm saying? That's not what I'm saying, is it? I'm saying that somebody, when they look at dogs, they get afraid. Fear of dogs. And you could say uh, dogs, uh, you, you couldn't say the opposite, dogs fear, because the dogs aren't the one who have the fear. So what these are saying, it's the work of faith, means that faith is a subject which produces the works. Love is what produces the labor. It's not the other way. In other words, it's not uh, uh, the labor which produces the love or the works which produces the faith. That's not what's in view here. Well, these people had a love that just served. And the type of love it's talking about is a serving, toiling love. They would, they would keep on going. What does it say at the end, what these other people were saying? They turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They, they just wanted to do something for the Lord. Now, even this morning, I was just thinking... You know, so many times we have, we're involved in so many activities in the day. And, and I just started getting convicted. Even, in, even I was sleeping last night. I was thinking, Lord, I just got to do more. I got to do more for you. You know, and, and the Holy Spirit puts that in our heart. So that we want to say, I want to reach out to other people. Be involved in people's lives. I, you know, I was just so impressed with our missionaries when they were here, Fred and Rachel. It was, I was just, you know, that, that is so good. You know, they were at the, the restaurant, and when we were all leaving, they're sitting there talking to this waitress, right? That's what it is. We ought to have such a concern and a love not only to serve our God because of what he's done for us, but we ought to serve other people. Just find out what their needs are and seeing if we can somehow meet those needs, right? Well, I'll just tell you right in advance, I had some more, I got some more uh, videos from uh, Abdul. Uh, I started working with Abdul and Nima, you know that. Abdul is Islamic. He was going to come to church this morning, but he, now he got a job. Well, thankful. I've got a car that I'm saving for him. It's in the garage, and it's a dependable car, but I know he can't afford too much. But I'm, I set a price on it, which is a good price. But now he's working. I said, Abdul, save up your money because I've got a car for you. But I, you know what's for Abdul and ones like Abdul? I want them to know Jesus Christ, that they would put their trust in Jesus Christ. But you know, he, he sent me these pictures of people that are really hurting again in uh, Afghanistan. There are people that have gotten injured in war, and you get these pictures, and I've got them, and I'm going to send them to you email this afternoon, okay? We don't have time for putting all that on on uh, 10, 10, 12 minutes of videos this morning. And if you want to give to them, that is fine. But we know also that there are a lot of people that are hurting, believers that are hurting in Ukraine, right? Does not your heart cry out for these people and say, Lord, help me to help them? You know, that's what it is, a, a, a labor of love. God shed his love in your heart through the Holy Spirit, and you want to love others in, between, in return. 
Well, you know what else? Where they showed they were changed people. They said, here he says, with your labor of love and your patience of hope. The hope that they had produced endurance where they kept on going, they had patience. What, were the, what was their hope? They were looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. Look what it says. How that you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, they knew because Paul had taught them and so we understand today that wrath is coming upon this earth. We don't know how close it is. It's called the Great Tribulation. The Tribulation period of time is coming. They were looking forward to it back at that time. They knew about it. These Thessalonian believers knew about it as Paul taught them. God is going to pour out His wrath upon this earth. It's going to be a terrible, terrible time. But before He does, He's going to take His believers out of this world, we believe. And say they were looking for Jesus Christ to come. Now that's what we're looking for. Sometimes when you see the things that are happening in the world today, how close are we to the time when there's going to be this revival of the Roman Empire? When Russia is going to come down against Israel, how close we are to that time? Uh, we're talking about a worldwide currency, a Bitcoin, a something, a cashless society. And now in the United States, don't you just wonder now... I, 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 we mentioned on Wednesday night, but the school of the Ozarks where Ben is going to school in the fall, they're in a lawsuit because right now they're put, being put pressure on them to accept transgenders and anybody else into that school, even working in that school. That is the pressure that the Biden administration is putting on right now. And I told my wife, I said, I'm getting older now, but if I was younger, I could almost anticipate that I would be put in jail at some time in the future the way it's going here in the United States. So these are the types, but he's, he's going to save us from the wrath to come. We're going to be delivered from this wrath as it's coming on this earth. So these were a changed people. That's what it meant to be saved. But another thing we know they were a saved people, it says they were elected people. Now what is an elected people? Look what he says there, uh, verse 4, Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Election is kind of a hard subject to understand. How could God choose people to be saved? And on the other hand, how could it be that anybody who trusts in Jesus Christ, whosoever will, would not perish but have everlasting life? The book of Ephesians, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, and he says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. It's like, how can God choose people? These people were elect of God, and yet they chose God for themselves. How can they both be true? Well, this is the way I understand Scripture. You may disagree with me, but I believe Peter says it this way in his book, first chapter. He says, says to those in the letter, he said, you're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, according to. In the Greek, we learn all the time, kata with the accusative states means norm or standard. So what this means is they're elect according to the standard of according to that standard of the foreknowledge of God. Now I know there are many ministers, preachers that preach that foreknowledge as God actually purposely knows people in the future and he causes them to be his children. He knows them and he knows them intimately. Just like God knew Abraham, I've, I've known him that he would, uh, you know, his children would follow. But why can't you just understand it as God knows everything in advance? Nobody has to teach him anything. And so he knows the heart of each one of us before the foundation of the world. And he knows those, if the gospel came to those people and the Holy Spirit opened their eyes, they would trust in Jesus Christ. You know, there are people, I think, that hear the gospel. I think there are people who understand the gospel, but they will not receive Jesus Christ. Why is that? Why is that? Well, 
God knows in advance who will receive his son. And if, if God knows all this in advance, he makes sure certain people will hear the gospel and be saved. He's not going to let any of those perish who would receive the gospel. He's going to get them a message. He's chosen to get that message to them that they would be saved. Sometimes don't you just wonder why it was that you were born in the family that you were born in or why it was that you were so blessed to hear gospel preaching messages that you heard? And I don't know what it was for you, but I tell you the gospel had an effect on my heart. The Bible says none of us seeks after God. There's nobody in this world that would ever come to God. Nobody seeks after God unless God went and, and found them and brought them to himself. But I had a grandma that preached to me all the time and I heard the message of the gospel. And I resisted it for some time, but all of a sudden the Lord just opened my eyes and I said, I, that, I need that more than anything else in the world. I've got to be saved. And so... That's part of God's election. It was He knows. Now, what are, uh, what are the, how did Paul know? How in the world did Paul know that these were elected of God? Well, that's what he said. We know your election. Why? For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance or conviction. He saw what was happening. When he gave the gospel, he saw the effect that that gospel had on those people. You know, there are times we haven't seen too much. I haven't seen too much in our, in our lifetime. But I believe when, when these people, when they heard the gospel, they came under conviction. And they were fearful. I remember a time when I was just, a, I don't know how old I was. I was maybe four or five. I was falling asleep. There was a bunch of cousins around there. And I heard the voice of my mother crying out and weeping and wailing. And I really didn't know what that was about. But I just think my mom wanted to be close to God and the Holy Spirit brought conviction on her heart. And she, was, she wanted to make sure she was right with God. And I think these people, when they heard the message, there was no recorded miracles there of people getting healed, demons being cast out in, in Thessalonica, not power like that. But I believe they realized they were sinners and they were desperate to be right with God. It was with power that that word of God came. Now, you know that's happened many other times. I haven't seen it happen to a group of people personally, but it's happened. I know it. How about, have you ever heard of the time in this country called the Great Awakening? The Great Awakening. The fires of the Great, I'm going to just read you some of what happened. The Great Awakening fires were burning brilliantly through New England. Eon Murray wrote, notes, As spring passed into summer, 1741, no one could keep uh, track of the number of places which were also witnessing the revival. Churches, which in some cases had been cold and dry at the beginning of the year, were transformed before the end. As Jonathan Edwards put it to the letter uh, to Thomas Prince, a pastor in Boston, it is a very frequent thing to see a house full of outcries, faintings, convulsions, and such like, both with distress and also with admiration and joy. This was the background and setting in New England when Jonathan Edwards preached the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Has anybody read that sermon? I read that sermon when I was in eighth grade, I think, as part of literature. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. There was a wide and general revival occurring at the time of his preaching. But what is even more important to understand is that the place where Edwards preached, the sermon was up until the moment when Edwards preached distinctly resistant to the revival. While in nearby towns, many were being converted. One church received 95 new members into the church in one Sunday alone. 95 new members in one Sunday alone. Enfield, the church in which Edwards preached, was becoming notorious for resisting the work of God at this particular time. Edwards had preached sinners in the hands of an angry God before. He preached it at North Hampton, his home church. There were no reported astonishing manifestations or response or emotion at that time of preaching. There was no response. But now he came to preach at Enfield, this town holding out against the revival, and God blessed the preaching of his word in an extraordinary manner. 
One tradition has it Edwards was not the one who was supposed to preach that Sunday. He was a stand-in. Such is the strange providence of God. A group of ministers entered the building house at Enfield where the sermon was to be preached. At one, as one participant later recalled, when the ministers entered the church at Enfield, the gathered people were thoughtless and vain. By comparison with other towns at the time, the people there were not even showing any particular interest. They were bored to death, let alone great passion regarding the things of God. In fact, they hardly conducted themselves with common decency. There was not an auspicious beginning. There was no atmosphere of readiness and seriousness, nor even normal, polite attentiveness. But when Edwards, Edwards began to preach, then he preached on this day in history, Jonathan Edwards started a sermon that he did not finish. Such was the impact of his preaching that the people listened, shrieked and cried out, and the crying and weeping became so loud that Edwards was forced to discontinue the sermons, sermon. Instead, the pastors went down among the people and prayed with them in groups. Many came to a saving knowledge of Christ that day. That's what it likes is like when the Holy Spirit comes with power and preached in much assurance. Can you imagine what it must have been like at that time during the Great Awakening? And I believe that's what was happening in the hearts of these people in Thessalonica. So on one hand, they saw the manifestations of God's power in even the preaching of the gospel. That's how Paul knew they were elect of God. But he also said, and you know what manner of men we were? You see, they not only spoke the gospel, but they lived the gospel out in their lives. So, you know, it's often said, your actions speak so loudly that I cannot hear a word that you are saying. God so worked in the hearts of these apostles that they would lead godly lives. They were examples for these people. I saw on Facebook this week, uh, somebody had posted an article about the way young adults are leaving the church and are not going back to the church. They're leaving and not coming back to the church. And they were comparing why some young adults were staying in the church and they said, well, these are the things that this, these people experienced where they were not leaving the church. But one of the most common ones is that their parents, even though they went to church on Sunday and they preached and they told their kids, you need to be in church, they didn't set a godly example at home. And so their kids said, it's, this, is, this is hypocrisy. And they would leave the church the young, as they became young adults. So but Paul and Silas and Timothy, they set an example. And so let's look at the second characteristic. I've just talked about now that they were a saved people. They were changed. They showed they were changed. They were changed people, and they were elected people. But now one of the characteristics we want to cover this week, and we'll cover a couple next week as well, they were a submissive people, a submissive people. Look at what the words say here in, in the first uh, chapter. Verse uh, 6, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. They submitted themselves to these apostles. They followed these apostles. They didn't have pride in their hearts where they say, yeah, yeah, they know some things, but they probably don't know anything at all, not everything. They didn't have pride. They were humble people, and they submitted themselves. And then notice... They also received the word of God. The book of James said, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. You know, later on, Paul's going to say to these people that they received the word that they were speaking to, not as the word of men, but as it was the word of God. They humble themselves to that word. And another thing about it, they received the word in much affliction. There was persecution going on. But you know what it says? It said they were served in, in, in affliction, but it says in, uh, of, the Lord, of us and the Lord, they knew that the apostles were following the Lord, so they knew that if they followed the apostles, they would follow the Lord. They were served the word of God in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. They were so, there was so much joy in their heart. Now, you know, you find out, I don't know if you get the correspondence from Voice of the Martyrs, 
I get the magazines and I get on email. But you find any of these people in these other countries like China, North Korea, you know, uh, Iran, those people who are being persecuted for their faith, they are just overflowing with joy. They might not have the food on their table. They might not have the job. They might be put into jail, but they have the joy of the Lord. They knew that what they're doing is they're honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what like these Thessalonians were like. They, they, they saw the tr affliction and the persecution coming toward these apostles and even toward them, but they received the word of God and believed the word of God. They were a submissive people. And you know, because they imitated the apostles, they then became a model for others to follow. I remember in the military, when I was in, uh, preparing to go into the Air Force, I'd spent uh, four years in ROTC at the university and went through all the military drills. But one of the things, in all the classes, but one of the things they informed us of, if you want to be a good leader in the military, you must learn to follow. The ones who can give a command are those who can obey a command. So they drill that in all time. If you want to be a leader, be a follower. Make sure you obey the commands. And uh, these became, they followed, they were submissive to these apostles, and they became examples to others. Let me tell you about a, a, a man that I know. We saw him not too long ago when I pastored in uh, Pontiac, Michigan. There was a man in our church who was really a servant. And uh, he had such a humble attitude. I don't ever remember, Tony was his name. I don't remember if he was ever elected deacon. I, I can't think that he was. I can't remember that he was. But what an example that he gave of a Christian life. When General Motors, he was a tool and die operator, so he had a trade job. He had a skilled job for General Motors. But General Motors from time to time has had some hard times and they lay, lay off people. Well, in this one stretch, they were laying off people, but they would still pay people. Those people who are in these union jobs, they got some benefits. They would pay people to work in the community to be a service-oriented job. You know what uh, Tony did? Tony then went to work for our church. He wasn't paid by our church, but for eight hours a day, he would cut grass. We had a large piece of property. He would cut grass. He worked anything he could do in that church, anything. He would be, a, you know, he'd get this paid from General Motors to that way, but he served the church that way. Another time when, you know, I think Dave has experienced this, that when they come to a certain point where they need to release some of the workers, especially those maybe with salary, they offer them a payout, and then they would take an early retirement. Well, Tony was a little young for that, but what they did do is they also retooled workers. What I mean by that is they would let them go to school to earn a trade, another trade, so they could get a job if they were released by General Morris. Well, Tony went to the community college, okay, and he went into automobile mechanics. And they were given a, they told him to find somebody who's got a, a need some work done on their car and you can work it on here in the shop and, and, and the community college. And so Tony knew that I had a car. Ola, you'll appreciate this. The engine was bad, okay? And so Tony, as his task for that semester, he's gonna rebuild my engine in the car. I think he must have racked his brain so many times trying to rebuild that engine, but he did. He rebuilt that engine in that car. That's Tony for you. And you know, when we moved away, we went down south uh, to Georgia for about five years. But I knew when I came back that Tony had become, had joined a Christian motorcycle club. Okay? And I mean, he grew this great big handlebar mustache and he wore this blue jean leather jacket. You know how they got those engraved things on the back of their coats, you know, what club that they're in? Now, some of those motorcycle gang members, they're pretty rough guys. But Tony, Tony became a member, and his wife went in with them to be a part of this Christian motorcycle, and they would witness to guys at these conventions that these motorcycle guys would go to. That's what he did. He was a testimony. He wanted to be a witness. And when I came here... To Grace, I would pick up the, you know, the, that Manning Brown about the chaplains. And there I would see Tony in the church in Michigan. He became part of the chaplain ministry there. 
And he even went over to Africa, and many of the, uh, the people in jail over there came to Christ, even as he shared the gospel. And there were times when, he, when I was in the church with Tony, you know, I would tell Tony, Tony, I want you to know, I want to be like you. <laughs> I want to imitate your life. Because he was such a servant, and he was such a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what these people in their humility they became. They followed and they became a model for anybody else. We're going to look at it more next week about their other characteristics. But these people at Thessalonica became a model church. Not just one of them. All, there's many of them. They were saved people. They changed life. They were elected by God. They were a submissive people. They followed the example of Paul and Silas and Timothy. Reserved the word of God in a meekness even in the midst of persecution, with great joy. But they imitate it so well that they get examples that others would follow as well. Now, I told you, uh, and, I, and I wondered, how am I going to finish this message? I, I made the message, and sometimes I have a conclusion, and it's blank at the bottom. How am I going to finish this message? I want to finish it, finish it in a good way. Well, I'm not sure if this is the best way, but I remember, I told you about the Great Awakening in... Uh, and that happened in this country, showing how God can work, you need to pray for this, things like that. I'm convinced that our church, if we were a praying church, and we, you know, were submissive in a serving church, that our church, we could see the work of God done in people's life, in our, in our neighborhood, in, among our friends. We really could. I remember that when I, we lived in Atlanta, Georgia, this is an example of going into a place where you don't see that type of thing. We, I was teaching at Old National Christian Academy, and I had, we had a student in our school there. Their father owned a bar, okay? I think maybe it was the mom's decision to put the kids in Christian school, probably not the dad's. But one time, a guy in a church that I went, Gary, I think it was Gary Daniels, Nancy and I, went down to the uh, meet uh, Billy's dad, we went down to the bar. It was kind of like the Irish pub or something like that. And we talked to him. Here's a parent of one of our Christian school students. We we're talking to him, and we said, Hey, Mr. So-and-so, I forget what his last name was. Can we come? Would you let us come and just sing a song in the bar and maybe tell anybody in your bar about the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you allow us to do that? And he said, Sure. <laughs> So, I had this song that I was going to sing. You know, I brought my guitar. And the song was going to be, I Should Have Been Crucified. Uh, here's the words of that song. Great song. I was guilty with nothing to say, and they were coming to take me away. When a voice from heaven was heard that said, let him go, take me instead. Oh, I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on that cross in disgrace, but Jesus, God's Son, took my place. The crown of thorns, the spear in his side, and the pain, it should have been mine. Those rusty nails were meant for me, yet Christ took them and let me go free. Oh, I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on that cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's son, took my place. Well, I went in the bar, and the bar was loud. And I started playing the song and singing, but I was just about drowned out by the people talking and everything. Totally disrespectful. They could care less what was going on. And then Gary tried to preach after that, tried to give a testimony. And he too, I mean, these people, they didn't even turn and look, I don't think. They just continued on their conversations, you know. I wouldn't say that the work of God was working in those people's heart. But, you know, it could work maybe later on. But I remember Billy's dad, one of the guys who had worked with him, he, says, he told him, you know, the owner of the bar, he says, that's not the type of thing you do in the bar. You know, he wanted to discourage that, you know. And so it wasn't much of a reaction, total oblivion. But you know what? When the Holy Spirit is working, and even as we're going to celebrate communion, and I want to really 
go to a little bit of prayer, a very zealous prayer today. And I want, we're going to pray for people in Afghanistan. We'll pray for uh, the, those in Ukraine. But I've got one person in the congregation. Well, he's, the person has come to the church, not in our congregation, but has come to the church. I want us to really pray diligently for that person, okay? If God does a work, amazing things can happen. And so that's what our goal is. Well, I'm going to invite the singers to come on back, and we're going to sing a great song in ending and also as preparation for the communion. Singers, you come up, and I'll close in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we know that when you work, Lord, your work is mighty. And Father, we would long to see you do work. Lord, help us to prepare our hearts to seek you and to seek your face and to believe in prayer when we pray for you to do mighty works in our midst, Lord. That's our goal. So even now as we prepare for this communion table this morning, remembering what you did on the cross for us, Lord, renew our hearts in love and in faith and in hope toward you, Lord, so that we might produce works and labor and might have patience and endurance. We give you thanks for this time we could spend together worshiping you and in your word for Christ's glory. Amen.